Hello everyone, I'm Matt Clay, Principal Engineer with the Discovering Safety Programme. And I'm just going to take a few moments of your time just to talk about the Loss of Containment Insights project and give you all a technical update as to how we've progressed uh, with the project since we uh, started it. So just a quick recap about what the uh, project's all around. Uh, really, this is a process safety uh, project. It's looking at major accident hazards, so those low frequency uh, high consequence events that happen typically in the onshore process industries and we've got here some examples uh, historically of um, some of the worst events that have happened uh, in terms of process safety so probably the most um, uh, known about toxic release was the uh, event in Bhopal India in 1984 which was a toxic release of methyl isocyanate which led to around 4,000 uh, official deaths, although actually the death toll and ongoing chronic ill health uh, associated with that, that event has continued uh, for many years uh, since. Closer to home here in the UK, back in 2005, of course, we had the uh, fire and explosions at uh, the Buntsfield uh, fuel storage site uh, within the UK. And fortunately, as you know, that uh, event didn't cause any deaths, but it did cause an enormous uh, one billion pounds worth of economic uh, damage. The focus of the project is on the onshore sectors, but uh, clearly um, offshore and in the maritime sector and other sectors, process safety issues um, still cause harm, unfortunately. And we have here an example of the uh, floating production and storage uh, vessel um, which uh, sadly in 2015 in Brazil had a um, leak of uh, gas condensate from a pump which subsequently ignited and caused a significant fire and explosion which resulted in nine deaths and approximately uh, 200 million pounds sterling uh, repair claim. So these issues are still with us uh, they're very important that we try and do as much as we can to understand the um, antecedents of these events and try and in, uh, input and to develop ways in which we can prevent uh, these events. At the same time, we know from uh, research that the amount of data that exists within the economy is increasing exponentially. And um, just for information, this uh, zettabyte unit is effectively uh, 1 billion terabytes. So we might on our personal cloud storage have say 1 terabyte able to, to us, uh, available to us to store our personal um, files, videos, etc. And you can see that across the economy, the amount of new data that's created is extremely significant. And when that becomes a cumulative effect, uh, the amount of information we have available to us is absolutely enormous. And of course, the challenge with this is that the use of humans to analyze this, these massive data sets um, becomes unviable. And particularly, and this is a key part of the project, when that data is unstructured. So when we're looking at free text information that's not uh, coded information, and we're trying to extract insight, uh, that can be potentially very valuable, but it's also um, challenging potentially and not feasible for a human to do, perhaps when we get um, to as few as 100 records or more. So um, we need to do something uh, different basically. And just to give you a background on um, this uh, hierarchy, which some people will have seen before, obviously we have data at the bottom of this um, tree, which is effectively observations. Uh, so again, our free text data uh, will fit within this. It's not necessarily being codified or structured in any way. And by doing so, we can create information which effectively is um, codified uh, data where patterns are, are noted, etc. Uh, we can then take that one step further and um, develop from that information uh, knowledge, which is sort of more generalizable uh, insights from that information that we can start to actually um, help inform uh, practices. And then, of course, at the top of the tree is wisdom, which is where we're effectively taking um, the insight and we're actually making generalizable conclusions from it. But importantly, we're also actually able to take some action from that. So it's actually wisdom as is basically what we've determined that we can actually use 
um, in the future to improve things. So in terms of this project, obviously the wisdom we want to know about is how can we more effectively prevent and mitigate those major accidents that can occur within the industry. And the challenge we have, of course, is that the data, particularly the free text data that we have, is sat at the bottom of the tree and we need to progress that through the uh, pyramid in order to, um, to get to that wisdom that we want. And this is effectively what the project is aiming to do. So we have um, within the project access to a large quantity of unstructured um, data. So we have within HSE's regulatory databases, a large number of document attachments. So these can be in a PDF format, there can be emails, uh, spreadsheet documents, and um, also word processed um, documents, reports, etc. Um, some of those initiating from the regulator and regulatory activities, so from inspectors, etc. And some of those are um, industry um, documents, such as internal investigation reports, etc. And what we can do readily easily is to extract the raw text from those different documents. So we get them all in a consistent format and we effectively have large chunks of text. And you can see the example on screen here, which is a loss of containment event involving um, some loss of spirit in a distillery, uh, which is subject to the, the coma regime here in the UK. And then what we're trying to do is to use various methods, and I'll talk a little more about them shortly, to extract um, value and, and uh, from that data so that we can manage process safety in a better way. And the flowchart on the right shows a typical progression of a process safety event from the underpinning uh, hazard, which is typically a substance, uh, either a substance stored or a sub substance generated um, through to an ultimate um, impact in terms of something like a reactor explosion through the various intermediate uh, sort of events. And the other thing that we're importantly doing here is including subject matter experts within this process because we know that the supervised um, approach to um, some of the techniques we're using generally works better than simply allowing the technology to sort of run away with itself and try and determine patterns, etc., without any guidance. So why are we seeking to do this? Well, one of the key things, as going back to the start of the presentation, is that um, data is increasingly available. It's there, storage is very cheap, and retrieval is fast. So the, the actual data is there. Um, often data is created for one purpose, but um, we can use that under certain conditions um, for another one. So for example, there may be asset management uh, data sets which exist but would actually be useful to be repurposed uh, for safety. And one of the important things, of course, is that field colleagues are very time poor within modern businesses which are run on lean principles. And so if we create elaborate coded databases for them to fill in, um, then that's not going to fly. What they can do, though, is create things that are useful to them uh, using free text, and then hopefully we can extract some value from that at an aggregate level using some of the techniques uh, we're going to talk about. Um, but of course, uh, the this isn't a magic bullet. We um, know that this is a bit like panning for gold in that basically there are some nuggets of really valuable insights in a lot of data, but there's also a lot of, of noise in there that, that's actually not valuable to us. And we know that quantity is not quality. And also that some patterns that are automatically detected by technology um, are not necessarily uh, very useful. So it wouldn't be particularly useful, for example, to know that fire and explosion events are typically associated with the storage use and processing of flammable and toxic materials, because that's a fairly obvious uh, finding that we're all aware of. Um, so we need to be quite clever about how we actually uh, use these techniques and how we supervise them with, with real people, with, with subject matter uh, expertise. Um, the other thing, of course, is that written language is challenging. Uh, not everyone writes in the same way, and there are all sorts of errors um, and um, terminology, and every industry has its own um, terminology, etc. So that's, that's challenging for us. And the other problem that we've got, of course, is that um, coded and structured data can have whole fields removed. So you may, for example, remove date of birth, people's names from a coded data set with free text that can be done but it's it's more challenging and it's not necessarily 100 
reliable. So again, there are issues around around that. And the other thing that I've discovered coming to this, um, not from a sort of uh, text mining or computing background, but an engineering one is that many of these text processing techniques are actually based on news, politics, fiction, and that sort of literature, and not on science and engineering. And when we come to sort of the, the deep extraction of deep knowledge um, and looking at things like chains of causation, um, that can be quite challenging. And I'll give some examples later in the presentation of what's easy and uh, what's not. So when we look at issues like text mining, um, there are some relatively um, straightforward things that we can do at the sort of easier end. And some of these are quite familiar from the sort of um, social media type applications where we might have a word cloud, which is just basically a frequency analysis. So it's looking at the occurrences of particular um, words. Um, and that may be useful for us at a fairly basic level uh, if we just wanted to get a sense of what various different documents and things may be telling us. But there's obvious drawbacks to that in that different words can be used to mean different things. And it's often the combination of words and phrases um, and how language is used linguistically that, that actually um, conveys meaning. So there are certain things that are valuable about this, but there are also certain drawbacks as well. And so one of the techniques that we're using, uh, or a group of techniques we're using on the program is natural language processing or NLP. <clears throat> and this just shows graphically uh, what's under the hood of some of these um, computing techniques, which um, NLP is based on. So basically NLP is very good at taking free text and breaking it down into its um, uh, components effectively. So here we see a fairly straightforward sentence. So this is a process safety example. The high level trip failed. And what natural language processing can do is it can extract um, a parse tree or a hierarchy um, to that, that sentence and break that sentence down into its component parts. So we see here a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And we have here effectively um, a verb which is, is failed. And then the, the noun phrase is the high level trip. And this is a very, very simplified example. Um, in reality, the um, sentence and paragraph construction is much more complicated than that. But you can see that by, by breaking um, uh, words down into this uh, mechanism that we can actually seek some meaning and understanding for them. And this is the, the principles on which um, other natural language processing techniques operate. So things like the ability to extract entities such as people and locations and some of the more technical aspects that we're looking at. This is how it effectively works, although there's obviously a lot more complexity to it than, than we're sort of describing here. And this is um, entity extraction. And this is a, uh, an example from uh, some of my colleagues who work in the National Center for Text Mining using some of the RIDOR accident data. And this is effectively taking um, uh, text which comes from um, Ridor uh, in, and describes an accident and then it's extracting entities so you can see here that for example there is construction activities it can extract equipment types uh, physical environment and harmful consequences um, and this is uh, very valuable uh, for us because this is effectively trying to extract coded insight from uh, free text and if we can do this reliably um, then we, you know we've, we're actually adding value and, and, and creating that wisdom we describe for people to actually use um, to um, improve process safety effectively. And so this is an, one of the examples in the um, in the project, and this is a piece of a paragraph that exists within HSE's regulatory database, which describes a um, an event. So all the whiskey drinkers, unfortunately, will have to look away now because this will I'm sure be quite distressing for you. Uh, but basically, this shows the um, development of an event, uh, which is a loss of containment event of a highly flammable liquid. And we can see here that um, what we're looking for are some of the events which are color coded. So for example, things like um, quantity of material lost, um, an initiating event, so in this case a broken sight glass, um, a deviation, so from the likes of HAZOP studies, we know that people are looking for things like overpressure, overtemperature, reverse flow, these type of things. 
and then the um, presence of prevention and mitigation barriers and how effective they are and also things like the activity or enabling event at the time of an incident. So this shows, this has just been done manually to show the um, some of the insights that we're seeking to extract. But what we're seeking to do is to reliably automate that extraction so that we can plug in free text at the beginning and then we can extract coded uh, useful information out of it. Um, and so some of the um, key developments that we've got to within the project is that we've first of all developed um, a course screening tool and really that aims us uh, aims for us to be able to extract loss of containment relevant records because often we're dealing with um, poorly coded data sets so it's not readily apparent uh, from the start which records are likely to hold information and which aren't and obviously to apply the full NLP processing techniques to all huge records is not particularly efficient. So we've got a, a, a mechanism for uh, doing a, a first pass, if you like, to determine whether or not the relevant records are likely to contain uh, relevant insight. We've also looked at various industry standards because there are standards looking at data collection and the sort of useful uh, fields and um, insights that might be extracted in process safety arenas. And so we've benchmarked those to determine whether the work that we're doing will effectively produce um, useful output to the industry and also uh, output which might be used under existing uh, sort of data collection and benchmarking uh, processes. We're working with around 16,000 free text records uh, so far, and we've deployed NLP techniques as described to extract some relevant safe process safety features. Um, some of those features are very easy to extract using these techniques and others are far more challenging. And so we've been working with our University of Manchester colleagues to deploy more sophisticated NLP and text mining tools to uh, apply to those more hard to get at uh, features. And so this is just an example of um, how we've progressed and the uh, ease of which we found uh, getting uh, these entities out of the free text. So starting at the beginning with some fairly uh, easy things. So um, looking at a mass volume quantity, uh, that's extremely easy to extract from free text as you might expect. So these are things like um, 250 liters um, to 25 milliliters and four tons. Uh, so these are things that um, there is some subjectivity to because there's different spacing and the different ways of describing things and you can use numeric or alphanumeric ways to describe quantities. Um, but basically, the, the, this is relatively um, straightforward with a few, few exceptions. And similarly for substance, um, if you've got um, a reasonably well-defined inventory of potential substances, finding in instances of those in the text is um, reasonably uh, easy. And um, then we start to sort of increase the, the challenges really. So then we're looking at substance lost. So we're looking for a substance um, in cooperation with an unde undesired loss event like a tank overfill, et cetera. Um, relatively easy to do. It's not 100% reliable, but again, um, slightly more challenging than just looking for quantities and materials, um, but, but not impossible by any means. And um, then when we start to combine these um, things together again that becomes more challenging um, but again that's relatively moderately easy to achieve so here we've got an example of uh, 20 tons of kerosene being lost into the site tertiary drainage system we can train some NLP uh, techniques to extract those without 100% reliability but, but with sufficient reliability to, um, to make that uh, useful for people um, and again, initiating events. So we're looking here at hardware and human factors issues leading to uh, potential problems in process safety. And again, these are, are relatively um, straightforward. Uh, it then becomes more difficult when we look at, for example, deviations. So as I described earlier, these are uh, things like high temperature, uh, low flow, and, and so forth. And the challenge here really is that, that the terminology used in HAZOP is not typically used within a lot of the descriptions of events. So there'll be a, a sort of distributed description of, of a particular um, event, which as a human, you can look through 
and say, well, actually, this is a fundamentally a temperature runaway problem. So we're looking at high temperature or through looking at various descriptions, you can work out from your process engineering knowledge that there is a reverse flow in a particular circumstance. But it's not quite as straightforward as, as looking at uh, some of the other um, issues. Uh, loss events, again, are relatively moderately easy to extract, although that's, again, nothing is 100% per, uh, perfect. Um, and then we come on to the effectiveness of prevention and mitigation uh, barriers, which, again, is uh, very challenging um, because, um, again, the descriptions of the loss, the, 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 the barrier and how effective it works is often spread over many sentences and in some cases, uh, many different paragraphs as effectively people are telling the story about how a particular event or problem uh, evolved. So again, that, that seems to be um, quite a challenging um, extraction. Um, and then we have um, some, again, just going back to some of the slightly more easier things. So enabling events, so the activities, uh, that's quite easy because generally there's a description which links a verb to a noun phrase um, and describes how some activity is being undertaken and then there being subsequent consequences. So again, that's relatively um, straightforward. Um, the other interesting development is that we surprisingly were, um, we, we consulted early with a number of different uh, industry sectors. And one of the interesting things from my perspective is that the nuclear sector seemed very interested in this work. Um, the nuclear sector is obviously known for its work in nuclear safety and radiological protection, which arguably is their number one priority. Uh, they also have conventional safety, so the usual sort of suspects in the workplace, things like falls from height, workplace transport, etc. But it also has um, process safety hazards, although they typically call these chemotoxic hazards. And they're very interested in how we could use NLP techniques to extract uh, intelligence on chemotoxic hazards to help them uh, manage those risks at nuclear sites. And the other interesting thing of uh, the nuclear industry is that it does have a lot of public domain information available to it, uh, which is quite um, useful and easily accessible. Um, the other thing, of course, is there's, there's um, typically relatively poor crossover between different sectors, and I think it would be very valuable if we could help um, onshore process industry learn from nuclear and, of course, uh, vice versa, because it just increases the pool of, of um, available intelligence and could be potentially uh, very valuable. Uh, one of the key challenges we have discovered through um, our stakeholder consultation work, through some fairly candid feedback from people, is that it seems that within major hazards, the sharing of data is more challenging than in occupational safety. And certainly some of my colleagues on the other projects that are largely occupational safety focused have had some good success in uh, sharing data within um, a well-controlled environment um, on occupational safety um, issues. Um, and there are some common concerns between sharing of any sort of data, things like data protection and how well things can be anonymized, etc. But I think within major hazards, it's certainly the impression we get that there are some um, greater concerns around the sector um, reputation and public perception um, issues, which means that there are additional barriers to us being able to share um, data. And of course, some of the work that's done in the process industries is, is very niche and the events that happen and the, their precursors are, are, are relatively rare, such that disclosing certain information can sort of in, in, immediately reveal uh, sort of one operator, uh, which obviously we want to, to seek to avoid because this is all about sharing of, of insight across the industry. So what we're doing to mitigate this is working on a more stepwise approach, which enables people to dip their toe in the water relatively um, early and get feedback from that. And we do also have um, a, a plan B, if you like, which is to um, use the HSE's own uh, data um, augmented with other um, public domain sources, which we can, can use. Again, we need to put in place suitable measures uh, to, um, you know, uh, basically prevent sensitive data being revealed. But again, that's that's something that's um, relatively straightforward uh, that we can do. 
So just to summarise the uh, project, um, clearly lots of containment events haven't gone away. They continue to exist in many sectors and around the world. Um, there is a need for uh, improving of intelligence um, to prevent loss of containment events. And of course, within the UK here with the coma regime, there is a requirement to benchmark against lessons learned uh, around the world in respect of uh, process safety. Uh, we already have credible data available to us within HSE's own uh, data repository. Um, and we know that any successful initiative is not about creating elaborate new data collection regimes because they just uh, will be doomed to fail. And so therefore the uh, use of unstructured data, um, including repurposing data is potentially uh, important. We've had some good success with the natural language processing tools that we use, uh, but some of the features we're looking to extract are, are easier than others. And we want to improve the linkages between this project and the other discovery and safety project so that we can uh, maximize the use of the sort of some of the more cutting edge NLP techniques um, that have been deployed on other projects. Uh, and just to reiterate the, the key challenge around this data sharing issue in major hazard sectors, which personally I believe can be uh, resolved, but I think we need to do that in a, in a fairly measured and, and slightly risk averse way in order to um, prove that that can be done in a, in a sensible way, which addresses the concerns uh, that people have. And just finally, um, all information on uh, this and other projects is available at the Bespoke uh, website, which is uh, discoveringsafety.com. So thanks very much for listening to that uh, technical update. I hope you found that interesting and uh, we'll be continuing to engage with industry uh, in order to uh, keep the programme and this project running successfully. Thank you.